if you have something that's older and you haven't done a complete rehab on it, mm -hmm. you're gonna be band-aiding that house for a long time. You can't do a normal capex of 10%. Like mm -hmm. some of these older ones, their capex is 25%. One of the things we learned to do is, hey, give us not only a rent roll for 12 months, but a maintenance list for 12 months. I so like now that. we can yeah. figure out what the true capex is, not yeah. your pro forma. All right, and we are live. I am so excited. We have a phenomenal guest today on our Build Me Up podcast, Brian Gonzalez. Shanine, tell us all about him. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Brian Gonzalez. He is the president and founder of Noble Oak Escrow. That's how we met. That's right. Thank That's you for right. your support. Thank You're you. amazing. Absolutely. You're the owner and team lead of Brian Gonzalez Real Estate Group, yep. coach, Cool dad. Cool dad. I love that. Cool dad. <laughs> Tell my son. Yeah. Right? When he's older, cool dad. It's right? on video and a podcast. <laughs> okay, so it's official. Cool, cool. And last but not least, real estate investor. Yes. Picks and flips, buy and hold, California, out of state. Yeah. And you've done that since, was it 2020? Um, yeah, 2020 was when I um, flipped the page from just sales to investments. I, I had a little bit of uh, interaction with some investment stuff, mm -hmm. but I never pulled the trigger like most people. It took me an additional five, six, seven years to do it. Yeah. But um, yeah, since 2020, I, I really went to that um, other side of real estate besides just sales and all that stuff. See, that's so exciting because <clears throat> you're obviously busy, successful, you're building a team, you're closing deals, you're opening escrows, running an escrow, and it, but yet you were following real estate in the background that whole entire time. Yeah, so like my investment my, wise, yeah, Tell I, me guess, I guess my, yeah. Here, so yeah. here's the story. Here's the right? story. <laughs> um, you know, I, I worked in finance for most of my um, a post college a, adult career, and when I went into finance, uh, I graduated from Loyola Marymount University in 2008. Right, so mm -hmm. I I got a finance job, and I remember one of the days I was going to work, driving to downtown LA. Um, a flower street, 33rd floor, right? And I'm driving and they have at that time, you know, those little TVs inside the elevator. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of understanding the financial markets at that time. I'm a new graduate. Um, I'm, you know, trying to make it work. I'm, I'm commuting from Long Beach to downtown LA every single day. That's a fun drive right there. Yeah. And I, yeah, it was horrible. And uh, I remember going up the elevator and as I got closer and closer to our floor, mm -hmm. the phones were ringing and ringing and ringing. And I was like, what's going on? And I remember that little TV in the elevator saying like, the Dow, NASDAQ are down X number of points and da 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 and I'm like, everything's red. And I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa, what's going on? And I hear ringing and ringing and it's, I don't know, 6.30, right? So the market's been open for 30 minutes and the elevator opens to where I work. Yes. And as I'm going off the elevator, there is a full like crowd of people coming on the elevator going home for the day. <laughs> oh right? my God. It was part of that big crash. And so um, <laughs> I've been interested in real estate forever. I mean, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, probably changed my life when I was in a uh, senior in high school because I wasn't the best student. And then I found this thing called business, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it, I, I still, I went to junior college because I couldn't go to, you know, uh, a four year college right off the bat. And then I transferred to LMU and then I got this finance job. And I remember that being like, oh my gosh, like what's going on as I'm getting off this elevator, connecting all the dots between real estate and all that stuff. And then fast forward, I went through a financial journey and then I got into real estate in 2016 mm -hmm. um, after having a long uh, kind of time off of following that dream into real estate. Yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a little piece of how I came here to own an escrow company, be a broker and invest in real estate. So 2016, awesome. did you become a broker first or the more or, no, uh, so, escrow first? So no, so uh, 2016, I was, uh, I had left my finance job. I was doing stock market stuff for a company and I was traveling all over the US. Um, and I did, I was like 200 days like on the road. And I do these financial seminars, eight to 10 a month uh, for many years all over the US and Canada. And it became like a very lonely road. Like at the beginning, it was like my other friend from college was working with me. So we do these seminars together. And then mm -hmm. like, as the company was like, we need to be more profitable and more profitable and more. And so like, oh I'm on gosh. the road in Ohio by myself, <laughs> like what's going on eating Chipotle, you know, yeah. like this wasn't that fun. So 
I, uh, I switched from there to be a proprietary trader. So I, I was a trader doing day trading for a firm in New York. And at that time I lived in Seal Beach. So I was getting up, you know, doing the whole step over the dog, light up the six screens and then trading. And I was like, I'd be done because the market gets choppy at the end of the day. So you don't really want to trade in the chop. So then it's like, then what? What's my life looking like? What I missed when I was trading for that 10 months a year um, was people, right? Mm -hmm. I went back to like, oh, I did the seminars and stuff. I really liked people. Hey, I'm going to get my real estate license to be a salesperson. Yeah. And uh, and I'll just do some real estate because I always want to invest. I, I read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, <laughs> and, and Senior. And I read, uh, I knew a lot about real estate and I had taken some real estate classes at Long Beach City College. So appraisal and all this other stuff just because it was interesting to me. And so I got my license with the intention to just learn more about real estate to invest. And mm -hmm. then what happened was that first year in 2016, I won Rookie of the Year in, in both <laughs> GCI and Volume. Um, and all I did was open houses. And so then I was like, oh, like I like the stock market, but the stock market stresses me out if I'm being super uh, transparent about it. Yeah. It's like every day, what's gonna happen? What's the news? Or There's so many variables. Um, and I was still performing pretty well in my own stock market account, but it just was like, uh, which later I, I said my headache meter, I'll explain that as we go on. <laughs> my headache meter with stocks was just too much. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so then I got into real estate and I just had a knack for it um, with people, right? It wasn't so much that it was the real estate thing. It was just, I'm a people person, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I could just do that, then I'm good, right? And so then... As I did that, I, I hopped on the ALC. I was at Keller Williams at the time. And then a couple of years later, I went to run the office, which at that time was the number one Keller Williams in California. Um, we did like over a billion in business, had almost 400 agents, um, started a property management company, and then found out that wasn't really for me. Um, <laughs> I remember and, those days. Yeah, shout out to my property <laughs> managers. Love you guys. Um, Keep it up. I, I, yeah, I, I can't do it. Um, On the list. Tried it. Yeah. And I like the model from, from a business perspective, but it's like to be the per. It's just, a, it's just different than what my personality allows. Yeah. And as I learned more about yeah. myself, I knew that that just wasn't the thing for me, which one of my dear friends who's a property manager, second generation, his dad's like, Brian's going to hate it, right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I hated it. I, I didn't hate it, but it was different than it what was natural. It wasn't serving you and your goals. It yeah. was not serving me and my goals. And for my personality, it's like, um, it just didn't work out. So I, I, when I ran the Keller Williams, um, as I walked in to be the team leader, yeah. the escrow department disintegrated. Huh. And um, that's where I got my first run in running an escrow department because we hired the new escrow officer and we oh my goodness. re recruit people back into it. So for like a mm -hmm. year and a half, mm -hmm. and I always said like, man, like escrow seems like a really good business. And everyone thinks like, oh my God, escrow is this huge cash cow. I mean, I've had like seven conversations in the last six months of agents like, hey, we're going to start an escrow company. Like what, what advice? <laughs> and I'm like... It can be just like everything else. Right. Your best margins are usually on a service that you employ, like being an agent, being a broker. And so it's just another brick and mortar business that has margins dependent on the capacity of the people that serve. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so um, when I did that um, during being a team lead, I got my broker's license. And then um, the last couple of years I've been investing and then it took me a year to get my escrow off the ground because of licensing and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was really where like my focus has come to is um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for someone like me in the escrow business. Um, I really believe in serving the community of real estate. I mm -hmm. like, to, as you guys know, offline, I love talking about investments and yeah. tax stuff. And, and so my thing was more about I'll just be the type of owner that's in there yeah. Um, helping people while I can talk about the stuff that um, people that are producing or not producing like to talk about, which is investments, right? Yeah. So I've, I've done a lot of investments out of state. And so that's kind of been more of my focus um, is being that owner because I own it 100%. We're 100% independent. Uh, and that's kind of my um, new focus, right? Yeah. Um, which has been good. We're almost to our first year. Wow. Um, and actually next month. I say Amazing. the first year, thank, oh yeah, gosh. the first year when my manager came over, 
or the that's when I do our anniversary because we did get our license prior to, but then nothing happened, right? You get your right, license, yeah. and I'm like, are you still coming with me? Yeah. Right. And it took me two years to recruit her. Like I, wow. I and it's wow. been phenomenal. You know. Congratulations. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of like how my journey came to be, and then the investment stuff is definitely like, hey, as um, lenders, agents, property managers, escrow officers, or anyone who's involved in this should really look at the investment side as a way to self-fund your retirement or lifestyle stuff. 100%. Right? And I think that's something that we we miss out on um, because we're so busy and the market goes up and then we're really busy and the market goes down and we're like triple busy because we have no business coming in. Or yes. Like it's the, the unit of uh, production takes more effort to get, right? 100%. And um, that's why I like listening to your guys' podcast because it's, a different perspective from each people mm -hmm. um, about their journey. And the biggest thing is, are you focusing on whatever that goal is? If it's to buy one rental property out of state and you know an area um, and you have a network to talk to people, it's not even about like the execution of it. It's like, can I come talk to you about investments? Can yeah. I come talk to you? Okay, great. Now I, I can go and, and do that purchase. Can I get a DSCR loan from you, right? Yes, Do yes. you know someone that you can connect me with out of state? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. that's really the biggest thing because as uh, people inside of real estate, mm -hmm. the tax advantages are really, really uh, uh, big for us, mm -hmm. right? And so that's been one of my focuses beyond just escrow and, um, you know, the sales team. I keep it small and tight, you know, um, and that is because I've built a business that's very sphere of influence. It's very family oriented. I don't farm. I don't do any of that other stuff. Like I'm like, if we're competing, it's because like we've both had a best friend for the last 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, hey, this random person called me. Um, so that's how my focus has kind of been while investing in real estate and learning more about the tax stuff. Yeah. That's really no. exciting. No, I mean, between, because that's a that's lot. It, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, that, that's a lot between, you know, 2016 and like how escrow like naturally evolved. And then for in, in that time, you said, I'm going to go into real estate investing, you know? So what, yeah. what was it that, because it sounded, you were watching it and you knew it was important, but like what happened where you're like, it's time. Because yeah. I know you mentioned tax advantages, but there was like an event or was there something that was like, did the opportunity present itself? Like, yeah. how did you jump in? So like, as you guys know, like I'm a big, people person networker yeah. let's grab coffee and talk yeah. right yeah and so um i met with a commercial agent and he was telling me hey you know like um i bought some units in birmingham alabama mm -hmm. i said oh that's interesting like tell me more right so we went and grabbed lunch at a restaurant in long beach and he's like i went to college out in alabama birmingham's this up-and-coming place mm -hmm. um there's this other place in Alabama that's kind of been saturated. Now the next logical move down is Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And then if that gets saturated, then it's um, this next place. Wow. So I said, okay, like, tell me more about the metrics of it. And yeah. so he's like, here's the play, right? Like you go in there, um, you buy a house, you get section eight, section eight pays more than private pay. Mm -hmm. um, and then you run your nice. numbers based off that. And then over the next six months, because I tend to be a thinker, Right. So I'm like, oh, Can yeah, analyze yeah. It? yeah. And I got to call people and then I use my network to call some agents that then, you know, um, introduce me to some long term investors. And so I was doing all my due diligence and um, he amassed like 60 something units in that time. frame. Wow. And I was like, oh, my wow. gosh, and at that time, they were like the 30K houses. Right. And um, during your analysis period, yeah, he yeah, no. and then they, they had jump, yeah, like he had like 60 houses, oh like, my like, something crazy. And um, so then my, I had a friend um, who was in uh, he did stock market stuff, that's how I met him. Mm -hmm. And same age, I'm like, hey, like you want to do this with me? So then he was an analyst for a um, uh, for a stock company. And so he's like, Oh, let me throw my analyst hat on. He went through and he's like, looks good to me. And so then we went in and, um, we started buying these houses for 30, 40, 50 K. And, uh, that is so crazy. Yeah. Like the, the cost, the oh, cost of entry. Oh my God. <laughs> it, it was insane. Like, and then, um, you know, I flew out there and then we took a picture with this like purple house that we bought and we're like, Hey, it's us. Like, and, um, it was just an interesting, experience and I learned a lot. I think I learned more than I have gained financially. 
Um, there was just an abundance of knowledge and people we met and property management from afar and all that stuff that mm -hmm. I think is setting me up for my next stage of growth in the investment world. Yeah. So how many did you buy? So we ended up um, buying 40, 41. Um, and then recently over the last year, my partner said, hey, I want to do something else. I want to tame back. He moved from Huntington Beach to South Carolina and kind of wanted a different lifestyle than the, mm -hmm. the California lifestyle. So um, we have sold 21 of those. Um, and these are single family homes? Single family homes, mm -hmm. yeah. And you got a blanket mortgage? Yeah, so we were buying them. Um, some of them are just one-offs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think our first loan we did with like Wells Fargo because they would were the only ones at the time that we could find that would um, finance a below 100K uh, mortgage. Yeah. Um, and they, I guess they kind of looked at it like the house is like an equipment loan, like kind of <laughs> like the rate was high, yeah. the points were high, but we're looking at it, it's like the math works. Right. right? Yeah. So what does it matter? And numbers don't lie. Well, let's just see. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, um, then we bought, uh, some portfolios of 11 and a portfolio of 19 and we did, um, the 11, we bought through a hard money loan. So mm -hmm. it was like 12%, mm -hmm. three points or three and a half points. And I negotiated super hard on that one. So one of the things I've, I, as we went through the title stuff and figured out where these people were, it was a lot of California and New York people that were buying and selling in Birmingham. Mm. And so we grinded them down. Um, and I think it was like 36 grand per house and there's 11 of them. And then we were gonna flip all of them and then basically do the birth strategy, you know, mm -hmm. refinance them and then, you know, create this equity. But what we found out, again, going back to math doesn't lie, right? Yeah. Is we looked at it and said, well, I'm pretty sure the market's on fire. We could turn these for a profit right now. Um, I think it was like four months later. And we were still cash flowing on that hard money loan with the money that was coming in. That's how crazy it wow. was. Oh my goodness. Um, and so we looked at the math and said, okay, if we flip these and hold these, what's our advantage versus um, uh, just flipping the property with no, uh, like just flipping the property literally, no like uh, fixing it up, or do we fix it and hold it? So those are kind of our three outs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up selling those properties um, in two groups to two different investors for an average of like 45 to 50K like four months later. So no improvements, no nothing, just the Wild. market was moving up. And um, we said, oh, we'd have to rent these out for X number of years to make the same amount of money. Yes. Right. And then we just folded that over. So that yes. was one of them. And then the 19 was a, a portfolio sale, just normal. We still own the 19 today. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's still chugging along. So when single family homes are between, it's like you said, 30, 60 grand, like yeah. that's, that's the amount for someone that might think that the margins are too small because you, you're doing quantity. Yeah. Like what do you, what do you say to that? So like that's where they started. Yeah. And then as we kept buying, they moved up into the 70, 80, 90, hundred K range. Mm -hmm. um, nice. I think if I were going to go back in time or like. Um, older Brian would talk to younger Brian. <laughs> uh, um, I wouldn't start that way because here's the thing that I didn't think through or that we did, I didn't have um, the experience to say through is if you buy a 30K house mm -hmm. and, and um, the HVAC goes out, it costs mm -hmm. the same as if the house was 250K. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. There but goes the every... Yeah, that's right. There goes your cash flow <laughs> or like five years. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so it's like you need some rents that protect you from um, those kind of um, things, like an HVAC or a roof or what. Obviously, you're doing your due diligence and all that stuff, but mm -hmm. things happen. Mm -hmm. In Alabama, we've experienced um, a lot of people stealing HVACs. Oh my gosh! Um, so wow, we had that's one stolen like, like a couple months ago, um, and you you cage them and all this stuff, but. Those things are um, so big, I can't even imagine I someone even walking know, like, down the street with an HVAC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, on their, like the Grinch, they're like running away with this HVAC. It's like, what's going on right now? Um, Dang. I was, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I will so not wild. press charges if you get me a video of you carrying the HVAC on your back, right? It's just so we can yeah. laugh at it, right? No, for sure, yeah. yeah. But yeah, like we had one sold and we did an insurance claim and it was like, man, the house was vacant for a couple weeks. Yeah. Someone came in, our team, or I don't know how they wow, do it, but yeah. man, if I could get some video, I'd totally 
fully would watch it. But <laughs> yeah, so um, that was the biggest thing is mm-hmm. one, like the vintage of the home. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have something that's older and you haven't done a complete rehab on it, mm-hmm. you're going to be band-aiding that house for a long time. And so that's another thing is your CapEx. You can't do a normal CapEx of 10%. Like mm-hmm. some of these older ones, their CapEx is 25%. Yeah. The 11 that we bought, the CapEx, we figured out because what one of the things we learned to do is, hey, give us not only a rent roll for 12 months, but a maintenance um, mm-hmm. list for 12 months. I so like now that. we can yeah. figure out what the true CapEx is, not yeah. your pro forma. That's a gem right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a gem. It, that's an experience only <laughs> tip, right? And yeah, I think that was the thing, like, we found out is that guy's CapEx was like 37% or something like that. It was something super high. And so then our thing was, how do we mitigate that? Um, mm-hmm. Because that's huge. So, you know, the revenue is big, the rent coming in. But if you have big CapEx, it totally just tears up your numbers because you could be looking at it and say, like, oh my gosh, like, my uh, my cap is like 12% or 13% or 15 and then you take that real CapEx and put it in there and it shrinks real quick, which is where I got the term of my headache meter, right? Yeah. Like, do well, I want to do What is your with... headache meter so exactly? So what happened was um, I started buying some houses in Kentucky or, um, and, and I said, okay, do I want to trade return for headache? Right. I like you going back to your trade lingo. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Do I want to trade that? So like, and, um, Am I willing to take a lower cap rate for less phone calls, less yeah. app folio or building them? Like, confirm this payment, right? Or confirm this work order, you know? And I think that was my thing. Like, as I've been around different people through masterminds and things I've done, mm-hmm. it's like, what is your thing that you're earning active income on? And then what's mm-hmm. the thing that's supposed to be, quote unquote, passive yeah. right and i think what happens in in our industry especially local is people confuse the two like 100%. and it's like i'm here to do escrow super well i'm here to help my clients you know buy and sell and invest super well i'm here to be a dad super well and then on the other thing it's like uh i do I, my headache should be low right yeah. i don't need uh, totally. oh my gosh someone stole your hvac kind of conversation, <laughs> right? And so in Kentucky, um, what I've seen is I took a lower cap rate, still good, like okay. six to eight percent, but it's like the only call I got last year on one of my units was like, hey, the garbage disposal went out. I was like happily to accept work order. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and other than that, it's like, can I have a dog in the, it's like, I don't know, like mm-hmm. property manager, can you figure that out, you know? Um, yeah. So then was older Brian telling younger Brian, like, buy homes in nicer areas? Or what is the feedback? Like, if you could do it all over again, what yeah. would be your strategy now? Yeah, I liked Section 8. I think the people are fantastic um, in the sense of, like, um, no matter where you uh, choose to rent to, there's always bad apples. The Section 8's consistent. Um, the people like, cause section eight doesn't always pay for a hundred percent. They might pay for mm-hmm. 90% or 85, but those people just want to live and do their thing. And then the government subsidizes them because of what's going on in their life. And the government just always pays. Right. right. And so, um, I like the section eight. I, we still, I think 65% of our units are section eight. That's what I was um, going to ask is how much. But yeah. That's right. We were up to like almost 90%. It, it's a thing that I, I really liked doing because <clears throat> we knew, um, where to go and who to talk to. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, if something's broken, they let us know the, the, the tenant and, um, and then we just fix it. And then, you know, the, the, whoever runs the section eight will just check that off. And then every year they come in and they check the unit. So it's, it's a good system because if something is broke, the, the county is going to let us know and we can fix it right then and there. Mm-hmm. Where if you have private pay, sometimes no one lets you know. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, yeah. what does that become? And that's the scary part is if you're self-managing, you know, um, are you going in there and doing mm-hmm. a six month check or a yearly check or all those things? So older Brian would tell younger Brian, Hey, go buy things that are newer. And that was really my biggest thing is vintage. So Alabama, it's like the 1920s, thirties, things like that. Yeah. In Kentucky, it's like 87, 91, mm. like, and mm-hmm. what I'm looking at is the turnover of roof and HVAC and all those big, um, you know, plumbing, those are the big costs that like destroy 
um, Any your returns. Sort of profit, yeah. Yeah, and so it's like, for me, it wasn't so much the demographic. It was more the age of the home was the issue because mm, in a 20s home, it's like, is there knob and tube in there? Like, well, what's yeah, going on? Yeah. Now you can't get insured, you know? And it's like, pull it all out. And so in these new builds, it's like, like the ones I just bought in Kentucky, the roof was replaced two to three years ago. So now I have a full, let's say, 20 years mm -hmm. before a big expense. My goal would be to um, buy it, cost segregate it, yeah. and then 1031 exchange it before that roof comes up again mm -hmm. um, as part of the investment strategy. I want to get away from these big ticket items where Alabama, the vintage of the home is so old. Mm -hmm. We got all that. We got weather. We got trees mm -hmm. falling. We got all sorts of things. Yeah. So then is it that. basically like 80s and above is your standard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 80s and above. Like I don't, I'm not scared. Like I'm from Long Beach. The house, houses are built in the 50s and yeah. 60s and most of the like stamped track homes. And that doesn't super scare me with a good inspection. Mm -hmm. um, but traditionally, I'm looking for 80s and above mm -hmm. um, would be like my buyer's box. I was just going to say, everybody has a buy box. Yeah, and so it's yeah. important you've had enough experience, you can determine, okay, this is what I'm willing to work with. Yeah. This is what I'm not willing to work with anymore. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really the biggest thing's age and then return. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of um, the Midwest and South has gone through a lot of um, growth due to that in California, New York, you know, Florida, it's hard to invest and get that return. Mm -hmm. The 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 play is different in California. The play in California is this appreciation, yeah. this higher cost segregation study, all that stuff. Um, where you know the Midwest South is a cash flow, and and that goes to like my bigger buyer strategy is um, buying these little um, little. Because you know the average home's a million dollars around here, but yeah. <laughs> little like a hundred to two fifty range is in the next five to ten years. My goal is to pay each one of these off in order to gain cash flow um, for my personal lifestyle. Right, mm -hmm. we're in sales businesses or have businesses of our own, and my goal in my life is to take out some of that ups and downs by creating um, cash flow. Um, that with paid off investments. Mm -hmm. I will also have by the units and all those things for my long term growth. But I think um, bigger pockets has spoiled us with this whole like, you know, leverage to the hills and all this stuff. There is yeah. a beautiful thing in having a safety net of cash flow coming in each month when you're in a sales um, position or owning your own business and things like that. So for me, my mindset lends itself to. I will pay. I will acquire and pay these off over the next five to ten years mm -hmm. in order to subsidize the ups and downs of all the other real estate businesses. I love that. And what would you say is your percentage of like your equity position? So let's say you're buying houses for equity versus you're buying houses for the cash flow. Is it kind of a fifty-fifty, or how do you diversify? Um, so I'd probably say right now it's probably. 20 to 30 percent is for the cash flow and the rest okay. is because i started the other way around right? you started for equity first yeah and yeah. it's like uh we always laugh when when um when i say this but like Ro i look up to rob deerdick you know the skateboarder robin big fantasy factory yeah. Yeah. as an investor and i was listening to a podcast um as we all did very heavily during the pandemic and all this stuff and he was talking about like um, his investment strategy and he's part of a, a mastermind group called tiger 21 mm -hmm. and they do all this stuff and uh, where they talk about finances and they have NDAs and all this stuff and he said my investment strategy is really simple I want five years of cash at all times and everyone nice. in in his investment group is like you're a dummy right <laughs> because what could that five years of cash do for you of course and that's why I say bigger pockets bigger pockets has spoiled us because it's like take all that money and like just do like six months it's not a bad plan you should have six months of reserves uh or a year and go leverage it so it can grow but his thing's yeah. like well for five years i i don't have to worry i mean that's a long time it's a long time then he has his investment uh, portfolio pay for his lifestyle mm -hmm. and then the rest is all the growth right all yeah. the businesses buying and selling and building and all that stuff that's his long-term growth and so for me, I looked at that um, and I was like, wow, it's a really interesting way to think. I wasn't thinking that. I was 
like, hey, let's leverage all the way. And then someday in the future, when I plant this baby tree and it grows really big, yeah. I'll have this, um, I'll get fulfillment from what I did before, which is right. true, but I believe it's half true, which it's just half of the story. And so the, the moral of Rob's story was, he said when the pandemic happened, he didn't know for a, like a month or two that it happened because his lifestyle had changed 0% wow. because it wasn't fi- a financial impact to him. Amazing. And that's what we're all looking for. Yes. Like, how do we put armor around <laughs> this life that we're building with our family and friends and kids? And and so that's kind of my thing is like I want to I want to put that armor around it that if the market like right now, the market's super tight. Mm-hmm. And um, how do I how do I put armor around this lifestyle I'm creating with my family? You know? Yeah, which leads us right into the question of what are you doing in this market? How are you pivoting? <laughs> and we always joke, you yeah. know, the numbers are the numbers. If the numbers work, the numbers work. But yeah. what are you doing specifically to pivot in this market? So, um, you know, uh, I'll start with like so like escrow first. I focus on my businesses, right? What am mm-hmm. I doing to create really good? client relationships, client value, what does our touch system look like? It's not just marketing like, hey, put a bus bench ad up. It's mm-hmm. like, am I sending a card out? Am I yeah. talking? Am I texting? Am I inviting, right? Um, this is like it, going back to relationship 101. Uh, relationship yes, 101, absolutely. right? Absolutely. And then the sales business is all relationship. It's the same yeah. thing there. And so it's like, um, I've been lucky that it's been consistent for me mm-hmm. and um, you know I went to an escrow conference a couple weeks ago and everyone's like this is the worst market for it. everyone hang on and I'm like I haven't experienced this whole like cash cow escrow thing um, but we're consistent and we're good and our clients are amazing and and we have a family out so I'm like what's well, like we're good right and yeah. sales the same thing we're good. And so the investment side has been tricky for me this year. Um, I just closed on one on Tuesday in Kentucky. And um, it was funny because I, I did get beat up this year. I was like, I'm not going to invest in real estate. And then I'm going to invest in real estate. And then I'm not going to invest in real estate. I'm going to hunker down, keep cash reserves. And um, I wrote a bunch of offers the last two months. And I just um, was getting beat out. Mm-hmm. Or they uh, stubborn sellers, which we all love, mm-hmm. right? And it's totally up to them whether they want to stay at their price or not. Mm-hmm. I'm just offering them um, a way out, right? Yeah. And then this one popped up on the market a month ago, and I'm like, ah, like I told myself I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm just going to write an offer for um, for 10% below market. Uh-huh. Just see what happens, right? So I just go on there. And it needs some work. And um, they didn't accept it, right? And then they countered me, and it was like five or six percent below list. But I wrote great terms. Like I'm very familiar with this community, mm-hmm. um, so I wrote very aggressive terms. I mean, um, the thing in the Midwest and South is EMDs, not a lot. And so, like, if it really, if you really had to pull the parachute, you could exit with a very low loss on your EMD. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, whatever, let's see what happens. Let's go investigate it. Um, so I, you know, accepted their counter. We went into escrow. Um, and then a bunch more stuff was wrong with it, right? Oh, like I'm out of state. Yeah. So it's like my agents in there like trying to FaceTime me. There's no <laughs> the signal. It's right by the, you know, oh, a bunch of. So you so didn't then, see it. It was all through FaceTime. All through FaceTime. Yeah. And then really it didn't work at FaceTime. Um, and so he took videos and pictures. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, I looked at it and I'm like, oh man. So I got the inspection report. I went through it. I called the inspector because every time I meet someone out of state, I'm, I make them do a phone call and or FaceTime with me because yeah. I'm like, you're not going to like, like screw me over if you see my face, right? Yeah. That's, that's my inkling. It doesn't mean it's going to like, real, <laughs> real, but I'm like, if we see each other, you're not screwing me over, right? Yeah. 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 And um, this guy's awesome, you know, was in the Navy or something like that. And you just mm-hmm. throw a job. And so I went through and then I did a request for repairs and I'm like, they're not going to like, like I am just really asking for a lot here. And then we settled in the middle for the rest request for repairs, which ended up being the 10% below list. Ah, oh, interesting. And so then I looked at it and I said, okay, um, 
now I just need to fund it and then I need to um, rehab it because it, it, there's some like the water water heater exploded. And I'd never seen oh, wow. one explode this bad. I like, never. Was, was anybody ins- home? I've seen a leak. I don't it might even, not explode. No, the heck? I'm going to say like, <laughs> like rust on the sides and off the top. And like, it, it what? Wasn't, like a first time. Exp- like, like, I don't know what happened, but like it was bad. Dang. And so I'm like, okay. Um, what is the cost to rehab it to max the rents out? And then where would I be in a position of um, uh, what it's worth, right? And so I looked at it from the sense of like, oh, it's built in the late 80s or early 90s. It'll be at market value. So I'm not burning it. There's not a, there's not a, uh, an equity that I gain besides just what it is. Um, but now I have a unit that I can hold for a long time that fortunately does have a new uh, HVAC system. Mm-hmm. The roof is Perfect. two years old mm-hmm. and the deck was just done. It's a condo. And oh, so nice. I said, okay, if my goal is to pay this off and create something that spits out cash, then this would be a really good opportunity. And so that's where yeah. I kind of switched. And then I switched to, um, uh, I grabbed a partner around here that does flipping mm-hmm. and then we're doing some, um, some flipping in Kentucky. So we have uh, three in escrow right now. Oh, that's nice. exciting. Yeah. So, awesome. So mo- mostly, so Alabama is, you still have some there, but now you're focusing more on Kentucky lately. Yeah. And like. people are always like, yeah. why Kentucky? Oh, right. And uh, <laughs> that's a good friend. Right there. Yes. Um, I know. I'm like itching my nose. I'm like, I hope there's nothing in my nose. You guys going to tell me. You're good. We'll yeah, tell yeah, you. Yeah, I was like, uh, <laughs> so I landed there because another agent friend had told me about Kentucky. And um, I did my research and again, it came back to that headache meter. It came back to what's my goal and intention for this type of investment. And then we, um, we, uh, I looked at it and then I started buying some and, and it, it met my criteria. And so uh, there's nothing super special about Kentucky mm-hmm. versus Ohio versus Indiana versus, it's just for me, I was familiar with it. Um, so, and I knew I had a crew. I'd established mm. a crew there that I could depend on. Um, I think that's half the me. battle. Is like you need Definitely. your property management company, your contractors, your handy people, all yeah. those people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that we forget about in the industry is that when we transact, we make money for people's families, right? Yep. Like you go sell a home, you have an inspector that feeds his family, you have you know a lender that feeds their family, you yep. have all these people, and the same with you, you do a uh, a resell or you do a refinance, you have mm-hmm. an appraiser that you feed, you have mm-hmm. a, you know, escrow. yeah, Title. Escrow. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> Insurance. we forget that like when the real estate market is down, there's, there's a wave effect. Mm-hmm. And so like for me, like having this crew in Kentucky, it's like, I feel good to say like, Hey, can you go check on this? And I'll pay you to go check on this. Or, Hey, yeah. like, um, you know, do you want to lease this out? There's a lease out fee for them. That's mm-hmm. one month's rent. Like those things are good. And it's very mutually beneficial. Um, and that's why I always tell people like continue to try to transact even if it's hard because not only is it beneficial for you if you find the right deals, like mm-hmm. in, we're talking about investing, but also it's good for the people that are in your corner and Aww. people will remember that stuff. Yeah. Um, I yeah. love that. Doing, See, doing good for everybody. It, it's so true. Like yeah. continuing to transact is a ripple effect for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So um, I had two questions. So you mentioned um, you had a, a partner. Yeah. So is it the same partner for both states? No. So okay. the Alabama guy is just the, the buy and hold. And, um, you know, I've known him a long time, like a brother. Like, he's just a good guy. Mm-hmm. And um, But his thing was just more about the long-term hold stuff. Mm-hmm. The Kentucky stuff was more, um, I guess, to be vulnerable. came from an insecurity of me uh, not knowing the flipping stuff. Like, conceptually it makes sense to me right yeah. i've read the book flip you know i get the <laughs> idea of it mm-hmm. but i think the thing that um again going back to knowing yourself and leaning on uh, in on the things that you're good at yes. is um like i'm i'm not good at the design stuff right and i don't really want to be super good at the design stuff yes. right? if you ask me like what's better um, light blue or light, light blue, I would say, oh my God, my head's going to explode. Right? Cause I, I don't know. Right. It's, it's, um, that's not how my brain works. And so for him, 
he has lots of experience flipping in LA and um, I actually met him through a friend seven or eight years ago and and he did a flip that he bought through me Um, and so we have this history and he's trustworthy and there's some longevity which is one way to measure any type of relationship Mm -hmm. Um, and so we went into it and and he's the other side of it Mm -hmm. so it's it's good Mm -hmm. like on the business and the numbers he's like deal junkie right and then I've assembled the crew and then I do the the you know raising capital and things like that right. and so it just kind of works um and so that's the other side of the context so two different people that's awesome yeah and then you nice. mentioned mastermind because I, I love first of all that you've had partnerships that yeah. allowed you to, to grow and you all have your strengths which is fantastic yeah and yeah. so we like to talk about that and build me up yeah. as like what was your support system who did you learn from and so you talked about did you have multiple masterminds throughout this whole entire time to learn these different strategies you know, this is gonna be the part that's not as cool uh, uh. in the sense of like <laughs> you know I've I really have had a struggle with finding a mentorship, Mm -hmm. um, finding someone that I can be like, hey, let me pick your brain about this. I meet a ton of people just because that's my personality. Mm -hmm. And I talk to a lot of agents and lenders and syndicators. And I've never had someone that's like I could lean on. And I don't know if like I do move quick. So if I want to find information, like I have this network where I could call people, Mm -hmm. but I don't have like a person. But this year, I really went through um, and had an honest talk with myself and said, are you really investing in yourself, right? Not like 19-year-old Brian that had no money and Mm -hmm. like the book was the best thing you could do. Like, are you really investing in masterminds and dinners and all these other stuff? And the answer is no. And so um, the fault's on me. I need to go out and do this stuff. So I recently just went to a mastermind in Sacramento um, that was, in my book, expensive. Mm -hmm. And it was a last minute. I'm not part of the group, um, but they invited me as a guest. And so last minute I said, I'm going to go do it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plane flight, you know, hotels. And I think um, the thing I got out of it, which was the beautiful thing is, um, it was the proximity to other ideas Mm -hmm. on the content we all know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And it was just like, man, this it's is like crazy. The relationship building. Also. Yeah. And it's like, I, I've been texting the guys and I'm, they're like, are you joining the group? And I'm like, I don't, not today, but like, I would be down to go to some more stuff. It's a nationwide group. And this was just one of their chapters in Sacramento. But the thing was like, I got some insight on how other people think on topics. Again, like it was goal setting. We mm-hmm. spent a day and a half on it. So meticulous that. I walked away with a different perspective because mm. the content's the same. Like right. we get it. Like, right. What do you want to do in your life? What do you want to do in your fitness? What do you want to do in business? Right. Yeah. But we the, all know the wheel. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like spin the wheel. Yeah. But this was like so detailed yeah. how they thought through it. And then the vulnerability of like what scared them about it. Right. So one of the guys was like, I raised 50 grand for charity last year. My goal is hundred grand. And I'm scared to do that because I got to be vulnerable and say, Hey, I got this really cool charity that I'd love to have you talk about. Yeah. And what happens sometimes when we ask people, as you guys know in this business, is some people like you as a friend, they don't like you as the business owner, mm. right? Or maybe they like, don't. Like, maybe like is not maybe like <laughs> is not the, the right word, but but it's like there's not that same support in the friendship as there is in a business. Huh. Um, okay. And um, and that's what I've seen sometimes. It's like oh my my I hear because I talked a lot. My best friend didn't use me on this transaction because mm. I'm my first year in real estate. Mm. And it's like, yes. you could have feelings both way on that. Like, I'm not, 100%. It, it just is what it Business is. Business and friendship are very different. It's super different. Yeah. And that was a thing, like, this, this perspectives I've got from these people. It's, like, so true. It's, like, yeah, like, I remember, like, my first couple of years in real estate. It's, mm-hmm. like, people, I mean, showed them houses for six months, high school friend, and then, boom, like, my mom had a realtor they used for 30 years. Right. And it's like, but that's okay, right? <laughs> yeah. Because if we understand that um, someone can like you and still not use you for business, it's uh, it's a good acceptance into that not everything has to be all together. Yeah. My belief is that life goes all together. There's You can't, I'm, I'm always a dad, I'm always a business owner, I'm yeah. always an investor, I'm always, a, you know, all these things. Some people like to compartmentalize those things, and that's mm-hmm. okay, right? And so giving this perspective of this mastermind was really nice to hear, like, 
hey, I have three kids, and every quarter I want to take one of them um, on a solo trip. So that's oh, excellent. That's nice. Yeah, and it was like, I didn't even thought of that. And I, I, you know, with my son, like, we do stuff together all the time, like, very active in his life. And I was like, but I haven't, like, I'd be down to do a three day trip, just solo dad and son. Yeah. You know, like picking yeah. up leaves and sticks and whatever oh, else to do. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm already there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, oh, we're doing this? Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's what's Sounds important. Great. Like, in 2024 is a big investment back into yeah. those type of things. I, I love, love that. Yeah. We have a couple closing questions okay. that we'd like to ask our people I'm is ready. Um, what are you reading right now? Or listening. Or listening yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we were reading um, at the escrow company. We, we do books together. Cool. Um, it's Unreasonable Hospitality, mm. the yellow one. So we're reading that together. The goal was I heard him speak earlier this year, the author. Mm-hmm. I hope I got the name of the book right. But um, really compelling story about turning his restaurant in New York from number 50 to number one by nice. doing things that are against normal business um, rules. I love it already. It gave me goosebumps, so, actually. Yeah, so good. So <laughs> that is that's, cool. Like, we okay. took a break for the last couple of weeks, but we're I think we're like halfway through, and then we'll continue to do that. Nice. So that's, and uh, do you have a morning routine? So uh, I, I love this question um, <laughs> because one of the things I think that happened during the pandemic is we all were like, thrown in our face from whatever we read or different groups that we subscribe to yeah. like get a morning routine wake up at three or don't wake up at three wake up at nine and yeah. do x y and z and um there's this guy that i absolutely love the way he thinks which is alex hermosi if you guys follow him online yeah. and he's like i don't make my bed in the morning i don't have a morning routine <laughs> I don't do anything. and guess what i'm worth millions and you know almost a hundred million dollars me and my wife and then his wife had another thing about it like hey i did the morning routine thing for two and a half years and my life was no better off than it was before and so like my thing is if i were to say what my morning routine is um it really is a fluctuation of what my life looks like it's like wake up and then be like thank god i'm awake right so like step one and then it's spending time with my son in the morning yeah. and then going to work, right? Yeah. And so I think my morning routine is really just that. Like, yes, does work stuff come up? Totally. Like, do I send mm-hmm. emails and do those things? But I don't have, like, a, my intention. And I did that. I did a gratitude journal for a year and a half. Yeah. And that stuff's cool. But I think that's beautiful. And to yeah. be honest, I mean, what a beautiful answer because not everybody does have a morning routine. And you yeah. can still be successful without it. Yeah. And I think it really lends itself to like, you're doing something continuously yeah. Yeah. by educating yourself and seeking out the people and yeah. just grinding every day. Yeah. That maybe it's not necessarily a morning routine. But you've got some really intense routines. Yeah, and I think... Or you wouldn't be sitting here. Chris, right, yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I right. think the thing that, like, Alex Ramosi said, it's just, like, get up and do the things that make you productive. I love right? It. And so if you feel more productive in a, I stretch for 20 minutes, cold plunge, sauna, yeah. workout, then God bless, do that. Right? Yep. And if you don't, and yeah. you just get your... I don't make this explicit podcast. <laughs> Booty to work, right? <laughs> then you just get to work, you know? And I think yeah, that's the thing that I've learned is like, I just get to work. So where can we find you, Brian? Um, so the best place to interact with me is um, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, I do a lot of uh, uh, reaching out and talking to people on Instagram. So my Instagram is Mr. Brian Gonzalez. I'll try one more it's, my Instagram is Mr. Brian Gonzalez. Gonzalez is spelled G O N Z A L E S. Um, and that's where you can find me. Awesome. Instagram. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. You've been just amazing to have on. I'm so glad I get to know you even more today. And yeah. thank you so much for sharing Thanks, all of your guys. knowledge. Thank you, guys. I appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. 